Hi everyone, uh, welcome to the Methods 1-2 lecture. My name is Kaif, I'm going to be your lecturer for today. Now, just a little bit about myself. I studied Methods 3 and 4 back in 2022, and I ended up getting a raw 45. So I'm hoping that through this uh, lecture here, I'll be able to help you guys establish a good foundation for 1 and 2. And, of course, going into Methods 3 and 4, hopefully that's going to be able to help you there. Now, before I get into the lecture, I'm just going to quickly talk a little bit about what we do here at ATAR Notes. Since 2007, we've been offering heaps of free resources just to make sure that students can really thrive. We've offered free lectures, just like these ones, since 2015. And of course, these lectures are in line with our mission here at ATAR Notes to help students as much as possible. We've got tons of free resources available for you. I'll go into a few of those now. There you go, there's some of those things that we offer there. You can find pretty much everything here at atarnotes.com. And if you want more info and tips on how to use these resources, make sure that you check the info doc under the resources section of this lecture page. We've got free notes, we've got free videos, we've got free guides from past students. If you have any questions after the lecture, the best place to go is the chat where I'm going to be there being respond responding to all of your questions. So please make sure you're always engaging in the chat there, leaving questions for me to answer. And if you're looking for even more support outside the lecture, we've got you covered with ATAR Notes Plus. Now we've got heaps of different guidebooks here. You can see some there, biology, business, chemistry, for all of the different subjects that you might be studying, as well as heaps of other resources. That's just uh, scratching the surface. So make sure you guys check that out. Okay, we'll get into the lecture now. So basically the game plan for today, as I said before, methods 1-2, which you'll be doing in year 11, it forms a very strong basis for methods 3 and 4. So my goal essentially here is to build up a framework, a foundation for you guys to build upon over the course of the first semester. As you learn more and more things in class, you can fill in the gaps and really have a very holistic and thorough understanding of the content. So essentially it will be going over content and theory and then doing some practice questions along the way to really consolidate what we've learned. And as I said before, please make sure you're asking questions in the chat. That's the best way that I can help you guys today. All right. So on the right side there, it's just got a brief list of the topics that we're going to cover. Let's get into it. So we're going to start off with linear geometry. Now, a linear relation is a polynomial of degree one. Now, what's a polynomial? What's a degree? Don't worry about it. We'll get into it a little bit later. For now, just remember that it's an equation in this form right here. Y equals mx plus c. You, should, you guys should all be familiar with this from uh, previous years. C is the y-intercept of this line, and M is the gradient or slope. Now, I'm just going to, just to be thorough here, I'm just going to remind you that the way we make this line is by plugging in x values along the uh, x-axis here, and then putting that into the linear relation here and seeing what y value we get out. So, got the x-axis here. If we put in 1, 2 times 1, plus one, that's going to be four. Sorry, no, that's going to be three. So you put that value in and you get a Y value. So you put a dot there. You keep doing that for every single value along the X axis and eventually you're going to get a line of X and Y values. So some things that you're going to have to know with, well, when it comes to linear relations is some formulas. For instance, the distance between two points the middle point between two points, many different, there's many other uh, things that you'll have to learn along those lines as well. We'll go into some of the more important ones here. So first of all, distance. Say we have two points. We know their x and y coordinates, but we want to find the distance between them. So if we were to draw a line between these two points, how long would that line be? So let's see if we can discover this formula for ourselves. Here we go. We've got a line here. This is the length we're trying to find. And then 
we've drawn these other two lines here so that we make a right angle triangle. Now, whenever you see right angle triangles, obviously you want to think of Pythagoras theorem, right? So we're going to label one side A, one side B, and then the length that we're looking for, C. And then we can connect all of those sides using the Pythagoras theorem. C squared equals A squared plus B squared. Then what we can do is we can try and express these side lengths in terms of our original coordinate values here. So remember x2, y2, these are just placeholders for the actual values, which we know. Uh, so, but the point of a formula is that we can plug in those values into the formula and get the answer. So you can see here, we've just rearranged the Pythagoras theorem here. And we've also substituted our knowledge of the fact that a is given by x2 minus x1. So x2 is the x-coordinate, how far right along the screen this point is. Min and then well, yeah, we're minusing x1, which is the x-coordinate of this point here. Again, how far right along the screen it is. So x2 minus x1, that's going to be this length right here. The same thing with y, we can do y2 minus y1 and we get this length here. So just rearranging the formula and then substituting our expressions for a and b, we can get this formula for distance. This is something you really want to remember. Uh, and these are some of the reasons why. So first of all, the formula isn't on the formula sheet. So you really need to make sure you're comfortable with the formula and you can remember it. A good way to remember the formula is to just think about how we use Pythagoras to get to the formula. That way it's not just you remembering some arbitrary letters and square root signs and everything in the formula. You can actually understand how you got to it. Uh, another thing to keep in mind is that it doesn't matter which point you substitute into the equation. So if we go back here, if we were to do x1 minus x2 and substitute that into here, we would still get the exact same value as if we did x2 minus x1, like the formula is telling us to do. The only thing you want to make sure though is that if you do x1 minus x2 here, you want to do y1 minus y2 here. You don't want to switch those around, otherwise you'll end up with the wrong answer. Uh, yeah, and there's a little bit of an explanation there. It's just because the formula calculates the difference between the x values and the difference between y values. So you can substitute any which point. It doesn't matter. All right. That leads us on to looking for another feature of two points, which is the midpoint. So it's pretty straightforward. The midpoint is just the point in the middle of those two points. And... The way we find that is kind of thinking of this idea of average, right? What is the average of these two points? How could we find that? And the way we do that is thinking about, okay, we used just the X values and just the Y values when we were breaking down the problem when we were dealing with distance. So we could try and do the same thing here, right? We wanna find the average Y value of these two points so what we do is we add them and then divide by two, that's the average formula. And then we'll get the y coordinate of the midpoint. And then the same th that's the same thing with the x coordinate. We can add the two x coordinates of our original two points and then divide by two and we'll get the average x coordinate. Oh, well, the midpoint x coordinate. That's a bit confusing with the terminology there, but hopefully this visual demonstration here kind of gives you an idea of how that all works. Uh, so of course with this, you just want to make sure you know how to visualize it and that'll help you remember all of these formulas. All right. So moving on, we've got the gradient of a line. Now, if you remember back to the very first slide, we were talking about the equation of a linear relation. We've got y equals mx plus c. m is going to be the gradient of the line, how steep the line is. So again, you should be familiar with this. So it's the idea of the gradient is mathematically defined as the rise over the run. 
So again, m is the gradient, and the rise is given by the change in y, and the run is given by the change in x. So again, we can use our knowledge of the coordinates, plug that into the gradient formula here, and we get y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. That's going to be our formula for m. We'll just do a little bit of an example here. Let's say you want to find the gradient of the line between the points 3, 2, and 1, 4. So we've got m. First of all, we're going to substitute this first point in. Remember, this is x1 and y1. So 3, 2, we're going to get y2 minus 2 over x2 minus 3. Then what we can do is we can substitute in this next point, 1, 4. And that'll look like this. So we've now got a complete expression for m, 4 minus 2 over 1 minus 3. We can do a bit of simplifying, and we find that the gradient is equal to negative 1. Now, something important to note here is that often you'll be asked, find the equation of a line, or find the gradient of a line. Always just use this. This is this should, It should be ringing bells for this formula right here. Uh, there are some more complex situations, but we'll get into those a little bit later. Now, again, same thing with the distance formula. Uh, if you want, you can plug in the points in a different order, and you'll still end up getting the same answer. So whereas before we had 4 minus 2 over 1 minus 3, we can just do 2 minus 4 over 3 minus 1. It'll still give us the same answer of negative 1. Now, one thing I just want to note before we move on here is that since we can define the gradient as the rise over the run, we can actually think a little bit about trigonometry. Uh, now, don't worry, I don't expect you to remember too much from previous years when it comes to trigonometry. But just remember, if we were to put an angle here, you guys should remember Sokotoa. We can use that to define the tangent of this angle as the gradient. So whenever there's a question that asks you for an angle, you should always be thinking about uh, the tangent of this angle right here. Now, for, note that this is only for linear equation questions. There's going to be some other complex questions that might be asking you for angles. Only if it involves a linear equation that you, you should be using this idea of the tangent of the angle being equal to m. Now, again, the way we derive that is tangent is opposite over adjacent. And now our opposite is the rise and our adjacent is the run. So you just substitute that into the formula for m, rise over run, and eventually you'll get to the, the formula for m. Okay, so we've got our first practice question. A line passes through the points 1, 2, and negative 3 and 6. We need to try and find the equation of the line. So I'll get my pen out here. You can, if you want, you can, if you have a book near you, pen and paper, we can work through this question together and see if you can get the same answer that I do here. So, first off, well, first off, we want to find the gradient of the line, the m value. So we start off by saying, where's my pen? Here it is. m is equal to y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. Now that's going to be equal to 6 minus 2 over, we've got negative 3 here. We put negative 3 down, minus 1. Then we can finish off by simplifying this. 6 minus 2 is 4. And then negative 3 minus 1, that's negative 4. And then simplifying all the way to our final value, we get m is equal to negative 1. 4 divided by negative 4 is negative 1. So that's our m value right there. Now we know that the formula of the line is y equals mx plus c. So now that we know the m value, we can substitute that in. So we get y equals negative x plus c. All right, 
So we'll move on to the right side here. The only thing left to do is to find the C value, and then we'll have the equation of the line. So the way we find the C value is we take one of these points and just substitute it into our equation, our unfinished equation. So what we can do, we can write at the point one comma two. I'm just picking a random point here. You can uh, just as viably pick this point right here, but I'm going to be going with this one. At one comma two, we have two, which is the y value, equal negative x. Again, our, well, our x value here is negative one, oh, is one, so we're going to have negative one plus c. And now all we have to do is rearrange for c here. So adding one to both sides, we get three, and on the right side we get c. So c is equal to three. So our finished equation for the line is going to look like y equals negative x plus uh, three. That's our equation of the line. One thing you can do just to check if you've got the answer right there and you haven't messed up in your working is plug in one of the points into your equation and make sure everything matches up. So if we take the point one, two, then according to our equation here, two, which is the y value, is going to be equal to negative one is our uh, x value, so we'll put one there, plus three. And sure enough, we end up with the statement two equals two, which is correct. So that means we've got our equation of the line correct there. Okay, so that's linear equations. Again, since you've covered this in previous years, I won't go too much in depth with it. In methods one, two, you get introduced to this idea of polynomials. Now you've dealt with quadratics, that's also a polynomial, but in methods one, two, you'll start exploring cubics as well as quartics. Those are higher order polynomials. Basically what a polynomial is, is this expression here. Well, I shouldn't say basically, because it doesn't look very basic, I understand. But you don't need to remember all this, just know that it has this general form. And then in your head, when you think polynomial, what you can actually do is think of it instead as an expression where x is raised to whole number powers. So for instance, if we have a linear relation, that's a polynomial where x is not raised, well, it's raised to the power of one. So we get y equals mx plus c. If though, we raise x to the second power, then we end up with a quadratic. We get y equals ax squared plus bx plus c. Now, the highest uh, power that we raise x to, that's known as the degree of the polynomial. So in this case, or in the case of a linear relation, y equals mx plus c, the degree of that polynomial is going to be 1, because x is raised to the highest power of 1. Now, if we raise x to the second power, then the degree there is going to be 2, 2 second. Uh, in methods, you can encounter questions, like I said before, which involve cubics and quartics. Cubics would be a degree of three, and quartics would be a degree of four. We'll get a little bit into that later on. Generally, the takeaway from this slide, though, is a polynomial is an expression where x is raised to whole number powers, and the degree of the polynomial is the highest uh, power that x is raised to. So there's different forms of polynomials. And this applies to anything degree two and up. So we're dealing with quadratics, cubics, quartics. You won't be going higher than that. It's going to be outside the scope of the study design. But you want to have an idea of what the expanded form looks like. And I like to think of this as the ba most basic form, where you have a coefficient, a number in front of an x term, and then you have the x term itself, and then the power that it's raised to. It's all laid out in this very neat manner. Uh, this is referred to as the expanded form. Now, thinking about what information this form gives us in terms of how the equation looks when we sketch it out, this form only tells us the y-intercept at face value. The y-intercept is given by the constant term. 
also known as the C term. That's going to be this term right here in the case of the quadratic. In the case of a cubic, it's going to be this term here, D. And in the case of a quartic, it's going to be E. That's going to give us the y-intercept of each of these uh, equations here. Now, the reason for that is because we need to think about what happens at the y-intercept. Well, at the y-intercept, the x term is 0. So if we were to substitute x equals 0 into all of these equations, you'll notice that we've got, in this first case here, a times 0 squared, which is just 0, b times 0, which again is 0, but then we've got c left over. So y equals c, that's going to be our y-intercept. Same thing with cubics. If we substitute in x equals 0, all of these terms here will reduce to 0, and we'll just end up with y equals d. So that's our x-intercept. Same thing with quartics. So always remember, the expanded form tells us the y-intercept at base value. We obviously, when it comes to sketching graphs of these equations, we do want to gather other information like the x-intercept and in the case of quadratics, the turning points, etc. But what we're looking for is what information we can get at face value straight away without doing any mathematical working. That's the y-intercept. Now, something you'll have to consider is with quadratics, polynomials of degree 2, uh, when y equals 0, methods 1, 2 expects you to be able to solve for x. Now, of course, you might have done this in previous years, but the way we solve for the quadratic when y equals 0, we either factor the quadratic, which is where we convert this quadratic from the expanded form into the factorized form, or we complete the square, where we convert the polynomial into stationary point form, or we use the quadratic formula. Now these other two forms we'll get into in the next slides, as well as the quadratic formula. All right, so moving on to factorized form. So factorized form looks something like this. You're going to have a constant term on the outside here. And then on the inside, you're going to have a whole bunch of brackets. And within each bracket, you're going to have some expression in terms of x. Uh, and it's always going to be in this kind of format where you have x plus some number. Now, not all polynomials can be expressed in this form. Uh, and we'll look at why that is in later slides. But you always want to be looking out for opportunities where you can take a expanded form polynomial, that's a previous form we looked at, and convert it to a factorized form. And we'll again look at why that's useful later, as well as how to convert it from expanded to factorized form. Now, if a polynomial can be expressed in factorized form, these linear factors, so these expressions in the brackets in terms of x, they're going to tell us where the x-intercepts are going to be. Uh, and we'll look at a little bit uh, about why that is in later slides. But just for as a quick hint, it's because we set y equals to 0, and then we use the null factor law, or null factor theorem. We'll get into that a little bit later. The last form that we're going to deal with is stationary point form. And it has this general form here. Again, not all polynomials can be expressed in this form. But if a polynomial can be expressed in this form, the information that we can gather at face value is uh, the stationary point of each of these uh, equations here. Now note, it's only going to have one stationary point. So with quadratics, that's going to be a given. You, you're always only going to have one stationary point. But cubics, sometimes they can have two stationary points. And again, we'll look at why that is later. Quartics can have up to three stationary points. Now, one thing you want to be careful of is the sign here. A lot of people, they make the mistake of thinking, okay, so the stationary point, let's say it's at 3 and 4. The x value is 3, the y value is 4. So let's say we're dealing with a quadratic here. We only have one stationary point. So the stationary point at 3, 4 is the only stationary point there. So we can express the equation of the curve in this form here 
they might make the mistake of going y equals uh, a times x plus b squared plus c. You can't do that. That's going to give you the wrong. Uh, that's going to give you the wrong curve. You always have to make sure you don't miss the negative there. So it's going to be a times x minus three squared plus four in the case of the situation that we're dealing with. All right, so we've got another question here. We need to try and solve this equation for x. Now, going back to the expanded form here, we can, thinking about that question that we just saw earlier, we have a quadratic expression in expanded form with something like 2x squared plus something something equals to zero. So we can look at this point here when y equals zero. We need to either factor the quadratic or complete the square or use the quadratic formula. We'll get into those next two points later. We're going to practice first factoring the quadratic. So converting this uh, polynomial uh, in expanded form to factorized form. Going over to that question, you can see here that's a quadratic in expanded form and it's equal to zero. So how do we convert this to factorized form? Let's give this a shot. The first thing we have to do before we do any working is we need to try and find two numbers which add to nine, which is this middle term here, but multiply to give 18. And where did I get 18 from? That's nine times two. So nine times two. So in general, whenever you're trying to factorize a quadratic in expanded form like this one here you want to find two numbers which add to give the middle number but multiply to give the product of the outside two numbers in this case nine and two so just thinking about the factors of 18 we can have nine times two that will give us 18 we can have uh, six times three that will give us 18 uh, we can have 1 times 18, that'll give us 18. And then we just need to think about what two pairs of numbers also happen to add to give 9. In this case, it's 6 times 3, right? So 6 times 3 is going to, well, 6 plus 3 is going to give us 9, but 6 times 3 is going to give us 18. What we then do with those numbers is we use it to split up this middle x term here. So we start off by writing 2x squared plus and then remember our special numbers here are six and three so we write six x plus three x plus nine is equal to zero what we do next is we kind of split the equation that we have here in half we look at this first side here so we have two x squared plus six x is there a common factor there in this case yes there is uh, and that common factor is 2x. What we can do then is start an open bracket and figure out what numbers multiply with 2x to give, first of all, 2x squared. In this case, that's just x. And then what number multiplies with 2x to give us 6x. In this case, that's 3. We can then close the bracket. Note that these two expressions here are identical. 2x squared plus 6x and 2x times x plus 3. They're just expressed in different ways. What we can then do is look at this other side here. We've got 3x plus 9. Do we have a common factor there? In this case, again, we do. Uh, and that common factor is 3. And just the same thing that we did for the first side, we can find the numbers which multiply with 3 to give us 3x and multiply with 3 to give us 9. In this case, that's x and then plus 3 equals zero. Now, not all the time you'll be able to take this approach to where you can factor a quadratic in expanded form and convert it to factorized form in the process. You just want to be looking out for opportunities where you can. Uh, in this case, I found two numbers which multiplied to give 18 and added to give 9, which meant that I could use this approach to convert it to factorized form. 
Sometimes though, you won't be able to find those numbers, in which case you have to resort to other tactics like using the quadratic formula or converting it to stationary point form, which we'll look into later. Uh, anyways, for now, we'll just finish off converting it to factorized form. This entire expression here, we can express it in another way. We can write x plus three in brackets, and then we can write two x plus three in another set of brackets. And that's all equal to zero. Uh, again, these are identical expressions. And you can see now we're kind of getting closer to factorized form here. Uh, in fact, if we wanted to, we could pull out this two here, We'll write it out the front, 2 times x plus 3. And then we've got 2 times x. And then we've got 2 times 3 over 2, which will give us 3 equals 0. You don't have to do that last step there, but that's just for the sake of completeness, showing that you can convert this quadratic in expanded form to a factorized form, which is at the bottom here. What we can then do is use the null factor theorem. So you should be familiar with this, but if not, I'll briefly recap. Basically what it is, is if you have any equation with a bunch of different factors equal to zero, then you can conclude that each of those factors has to be also equal to zero. So in this case, we have x plus three equals zero. And then we also have x plus three over two equal to zero. We can then move uh, three over to solve for x. So we get x equals negative three or x equals negative three over two. So that's our solutions there. We've solved for x. We either have x equals to negative three or x equals to negative three over two. Now, if you want to, you can check your answers by substituting them back into the equation and making sure that everything reduces down to zero. In this case, we'll do it with our answer x equals negative 3. So we've got 2 times negative 3 squared plus 9 times negative 3 plus 9 is equal to 0. So 2 times negative 3 squared, that's going to be 2 times 9. And then we've got 9 times negative 3, which is negative 27. And then we've got 9 at the end equals 0. That's 18 minus 27 plus 9 equals 0, and finally 0 equals 0. So that means we've done our working out correctly. All right, now I kind of gave a more difficult scenario here where um, you have a number in front of the x squared term here, in this case the number's 2. Often you won't have that number there. So you'll find that when you do the working out, it's going to be easier to uh, convert into factorized form and then find your required values for x. Okay, so one other thing we can do in the event that we can't convert a quadratic in expanded form into uh, factorized form, we can instead complete the square and this will convert it into stationary point form. So in general, with a quadratic in the form x squared plus bx plus c, uh, give me a second, there's my mouse. All right, so you have this and we want to convert it to uh, stationary point form. The first step that we have to do, we have to take the b term and we need to square it because we get b squared. Then what we do is, Oh, no, 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 sorry, okay. So, you, sorry, you take the b, uh, b term, you divide it by 2, and then you take that entire expression and you square it. So, that would look like, if I just draw it out here, we have b over 2 squared. Uh, obviously, simplifying that, that leaves us with b squared over 4. This is going to be a very special term. What we have to do is we take this term and we add it, to the right side and then also subtract it. So we'd write out x squared plus bx plus b squared over four minus b squared over four plus c. So that way, 
we can use some magical properties of this term here, which we'll look into in the next line of working, without actually changing the overall meaning of this expression here. Y is still equal to this expression as it is equal to this expression here. Um, the next step is then to use one of the magical properties of this b squared over 4 term. It turns out when you add this term to uh, x squared plus bx, you get what's called a perfect square, which is something that can be expressed in this form right here. So x plus something squared. This is, you can see it's getting much closer now to the stationary point form. Remember that was y equals a times open bracket x plus or x minus b close bracket squared plus uh, c. You can see it's conforming to that form a lot more now. So that's the first three terms there, which get reduced into this expression here, x plus b over 2 squared. We're then just left with these terms here hanging on the outside, negative b squared over 4 plus c. Um, but again, you've got to remember that oh, b is a value here. So all of this, you can simplify it to just some value. And so eventually, when you do all that simplification, you'll end up with something in uh, stationary point form. We'll do some practice on this though, so you have a better idea of what I mean. So we need to express the following quadratic in the form y equals a times x, well that should be minus b squared plus c. That's the stationary point form, so we can do some practice on completing the square here. The first thing we want to do is recognize what our b term is. That's negative 6. So our first line of working will look like y equals x squared uh, minus 6x. Then we want to think about what b squared over 4 is. In this case, we're doing negative 6, um, well, divided by 2 and then squared, which is the same as b squared over 4. So negative 6 divided by 2, that's going to be negative 3. And then we square that, we're going to get 9. So what we can write here is x squared minus 6x plus 9, minus 9. And then we've just got this minus 1 at the end there. All right. Now, as we saw in the previous slide, these first three terms will reduce into a perfect square, which has the form x plus b over 2. In this case, b over 2 is negative 6 over 2. So we have x minus 6 over 2, which is 3 squared. And then we've just got these terms to deal with here, minus 9, minus 1, which simplifies to 10. So there we go. We've now expressed our quadratic uh, in stationary point form. And just for the sake of completeness, the turning point of this quadratic here would be 3 and negative 10. So if we were to sketch this, it looks something like uh, that, where we'd have this point here, 3 and negative 10. Okay. So just to get a bit more practice with this, this time we've got a number in front of the x squared term. Uh, you might think that it makes it a little bit more complicated to get to stationary point form, but actually it's really simple. All we do is we factor out that 3 term. So we get y equals 3, and then we open up a bracket, and then we just factor out the 3. So x squared times 3 will give us 3x squared. Um, what else? We've got negative 2x times 3 will give us negative 6x. And then we've got, what is that? Negative 1 over 3. If we multiply that by 3, then we get negative 1. So we factor it out, and then we just reduce this uh, expression here into stationary point form. So we've got 3x squared minus 2x. Our b term here is now negative 2. So we need to be thinking about negative 2 over 2 squared, what that's going to be. In this case, negative 2 over 2 is negative 1. And then we square that, we're going to get 1. So we'll write plus 1 minus 1, 
minus one third. Then again, we can use that little trick where we convert this into a perfect square. We get three open bracket. We want to open another set of brackets just so we can write this uh, expression involving three terms in a per as a perfect square. So we get x plus b over two. In this case, b over two is negative one, negative two over two. So we write minus one squared. And then we've got the minus one minus one third hanging out on the edge there. So we'll simplify that into minus four over three. The last thing we want to do is just multiply out this three term uh, out in the front here. So we get three open bracket x minus one squared. And then we also have three times negative four over three, which is just going to be going to be canceling the threes, we get negative four. So there we go, we've now expressed this quadratic in uh, stationary point form. Uh, the last thing we can do, so we've already looked at uh, factorizing a quadratic equation in expanded form to get it into factorized form. Uh, we've also looked at converting it to stationary point form by completing the square. The last thing we can do is use the quadratic formula. So this will directly give us the solutions for x. Uh, and this will be very, very important if you're given uh, an equation like this. You can use those two other methods where you convert to factorized or stationary point form, or you can just directly use the quadratic formula. As you do more and more questions, you'll figure out which uh, route is the best to take and saves the most time. So the way the quadratic formula works is it's this expression right here. Now, it's good habit to get into. Well, it's it's good to get into the habit of remembering this formula, just because you're going to be using it a lot, and so it's better than frequently looking back at your uh, formula sheet or something like that, which will end up uh, wasting a lot of time in your stats. Uh, so. The way we use this, it's the same, we, same way we use any other formula. We have our a term, b term, and c term in our quadratic. We just substitute those into this formula. Now, in terms of the way we get to this formula, like how it was discovered, you don't need to know this, but it's basically all this working on the right here. Uh, so if you're, if you're finding yourself more interested in the maths behind quadratics, then you can look into the way that's derived. But this is outside the scope of the study design. You don't need to know all those steps. Uh, okay. So we get some practice using the quadratic formula here. We've got this equation here, fx equals 2x squared minus 4x minus 3. Uh, fx just means function, so think of this just as y. In this case, we're looking for the solutions. So we're looking for what happens when y equals zero. So we've got zero equals two x squared minus four x minus three. So again, we could convert to factorized form by finding two numbers which multiply to give the product of negative three and two. In this case, that's negative six and add to give negative four. In this case, I can't think of any two numbers. So that uh, method is out of the question. We could also convert it into stationary point form. Uh, but in this case, the question is asking us to use the quadratic formula. So that's the method we're going to use. So again, the quadratic formula looks like this. Negative B plus or minus the square root of B squared minus 4AC all over 2A. Um, then we just start substituting in our numbers. So in this case, b is negative four. So we have x equal to negative negative four plus or minus the square root of b squared, which is negative four squared minus four. We have a is equal to two. So we'll write two there. And then c is equal to negative three. So we'll write in three there. Uh, we'll end that square root all over two times a, which is two. 
uh, we'll move our working up here. We can just start simplifying this. So I'm going to skip a couple steps here. We've got 4 plus or minus 4 squared is 16. Uh, and then 4 times 2 times negative 3. Uh, we've got this negative sign out front here as well, so that's going to be positive. 4 times 2 times 3 is 4 times 6, which is 24. So we have 16 plus 24, which is, what is that? 40. Um, have that all over 4. Now we can actually simplify this a little bit more. We've got 4 plus or minus. 40, we can write this as, uh, actually I'll do the working up here, we've got root 40. We can rewrite this as root 4 times uh, 10. And then we can split up the square root sign, we get root 4 times root 10, which is just 2 times root 10. So what we can actually do is chuck a 2 out front here, we get 10 under the square root sign, and then we have the 4. And then just dividing the top and bottom of the fraction by the common factor. That's the way we simplify our fractions. We get 2 plus or minus uh, root 10 over 2. So the final answer, you don't want to keep it in this form. You want to actually write it as it's two separate solutions. So we have x equals 2 plus root 10 over 2. And then we have x equals two minus uh, root 10 over two. Okay, um, all right, so there's the working there. Let's just make sure we've got the correct working. Yeah, there we go. So x equals four plus or minus root 40 over four. And we've just gone ahead and simplified our answer a little bit more. All right, cool. Now, the thing is, I did skip a few steps in my working here. You can see that, uh, especially going from, let me get my mouse back, going from here to here. I did most of the working out in my head. But if you don't want to make mistakes, you really want to make sure that you're writing out all the uh, all the steps. Sorry, if, you're, if you don't want to make mistakes, make sure you write out every step. So that's that there. Okay, we have a different quadratic here. Is that a different quadratic? No, we have the same quadratic. Okay, we already did that uh, question. You can see there the answers are in much more simplified form there. All right, so thinking about what this actually means, we're looking at what happens when the y value is equal to zero. That's what we're using the quadratic formula for. And when the y value is zero, that means we're looking for the values at which the graph of this quadratic touches the x-axis or intersects the x-axis. That's where y is equal to zero. Uh, in this case, what we ended up finding, those two values, 2 plus root 10 over 2 and 2 minus root 10 over 2, that's going to give us the x-intercepts. So that's something important to know. Whenever you're trying to sketch a quadratic, not only do you want to take down that base value information that you get. So in the case of expanded form, you can tell straight away the y-intercept is going to be at negative 3. You can see that there. Uh, in stationary point form, you'll know exactly where the turning point is straight away. Uh, in factorized form, you'll know where the x-intercepts are straight away. You also want to be looking for that additional information, like the x-intercepts, the turning point, the axis of symmetry, all of that. So what we've looked at are three ways we can find those x-intercepts, or in general, just find the solutions when y is equal to zero for a quadratic. Uh, so that's basically what I went over there. In terms of actually finding the turning point and axis of symmetry and stuff, we'll look at an example here. We've got x squared minus 4x plus 3. Straight away, the face value info is that the y-intercept is at 3. The x-intercept we can find that by setting y equal to zero and then using one of those three methods. Uh, in this case, we're using the first method. We're converting from expanded form to factorized form. So we've got x minus three and x minus one. Using the null factor theorem, x is equal to three or x is equal to one. 
the turning point is a little bit different here. To find the turning point when you have expanded form, what you do is you use a couple formulas, or actually just one formula. And that formula is x equals negative b over 2a. What this gives you is the x coordinate of the turning point. So in this case, the turning point is here. We know that it's the x coordinate is going to be positive and the y coordinate is going to be negative. And sure enough, when we use that formula, we find out that the x coordinate of the turning point is 2. So you do that, and then to find the corresponding y coordinate, for that particular x coordinate of 2, you just substitute x equals 2 into the equation and you find the y coordinate is negative 1. So then you can definitively state that the turning point is at 2 and negative 1. Now, the axis of symmetry is just the line along which, if you were to fold the parabola that you've got here in half, uh, it would fold perfectly along itself. So this is the line that's running through the turning point. Uh, and you can use that information to deduce the fact that the axis of symmetry is given by the line x equals 2. So that's going to be a line running straight down here, where every x value uh, for any point along that line is going to be 2. Okay. Now, with factorized form, one thing you want to remember is that if the factor is linear, so if you just have x minus some number and there's no power on the outside, then the graph is going to cut through that point A. So you can see it's just cutting through the point. If it's squared though, the graph is going to touch the point and then start heading back the same way it came from. So in this case, it's coming down from the top. It touches at the point A along the x-axis and then it starts heading back up. If it's raised to the third power, which we'll start to look into that now, uh, you're going to have what's called a point of inflection, which is where it runs into the point, it curves and curves, and then at one point it's traveling parallel to the line, uh, parallel to the x-axis. But then it starts curving away again and heading back in the same direction. This is called a point of inflection. You don't need to know that though. Just make sure you know that Based on the power that the factor is raised to, make sure you know how the graph is going to interact with the x-axis at that particular point. Okay, now we're going to talk about this thing called the discriminant. You may not, or may not have covered this before, but basically the discriminant is really useful because it can help us better understand the shape of the parabola. Uh, for any that corresponds to any quadratic equation. So if we look at the quadratic formula, we can make some observations. This b squared minus 4ac term is under a square root, which means it can't be negative. Because remember, if we have a negative number inside a square root, there's no solution to it. You can't find two numbers that multiply to give a negative number. So what this means then is if we have a positive number under the square root, then we're going to end up with some solutions, uh, two solutions for x. So either we're going to have b plus and then this expression, square root b squared minus 4ac, all over 2a, or our second solution is going to be b minus square root b squared minus 4ac, all over 2a. Uh, if it's... Actually, we'll go into that a little bit later. Yeah, so this, this expression here, b squared minus 4ac, it's called the discriminant. And we give it the uh, symbol delta, which just looks like a triangle. Okay, yeah, so if this expression is greater than zero, we get two solutions, like I just said. If it's equal to zero, then the plus or minus doesn't really matter we just end up with one solution. So x equals negative b over 2a. That's it, that's the only solution. If though the discriminant is less than zero, then we don't get any solutions because remember, this number under the square root is negative, then there's no solutions. So 
we won't have any solutions for x in general. We can think about this graphically as well. If we have no solutions for x, and remember the quadratic formula is giving us the value of x when y equals 0. So if we have no solutions for x, then the discriminant is less than 0. And that means that there's going to be no x value when y is equal to 0. So that looks something like this. When y equals 0, you can see the graph doesn't intersect that point. There's no x value. If, though, we have the discriminant equal to 0, then we're going to have the parabola just touching the x-axis. Not necessarily at the origin, like it is in this diagram here. Uh, it could be touching anywhere along the x-axis at that particular solution that we find for x. If, though, the discriminant is greater than 0, then that means we get two values for x when y is equal to 0. So we're going to have this lower value here and this upper value here. So why is this useful though, right? Like, sure, you, you know this information about how the graph looks, but in the end, you're going to have to look for the x-intercepts and y-intercepts anyways, right? But the thing is, sometimes you get questions like this, where you have to find the values of m for which the graph of y equals fx has exactly one x-intercept. Uh, I'll get my pen out here. This is where we can use that idea of the discriminant. So first off, we want one x-intercept. We know that that means that the discriminant is going to be equal to zero. So the first thing we want to do is find the value of the discriminant. In this case, it doesn't take a particular value. It's going to take an expression on, it's going to take on the form of an expression in terms of m. So remember the discriminant is b squared minus 4ac. In this case, the b value is m. So we get m squared minus 4 times a, which is 1, and c, which is 4. So 4 times 1 times 4. That's going to give us m squared minus 16. Okay. Now we require uh, the discriminant to be equal to 0. So therefore, we have 0 equal to our expression for the discriminant, m squared minus 16. Um, we can just do some simple rearranging and solve for m. So adding 16 to both sides, we get 16 equals m squared. Uh, and then we take the square root of both sides. m is equal to plus or minus the square root of 16, so plus or minus 4. Um, always make sure whenever you're taking the square root of something that you put the plus or minus signs. And yeah, that's our answer there. So again, we don't want to leave our answer in this form. We want to say m is equal to 4 or m is equal to negative 4. So that's our final answer there. So what we've done is we found the values of m. If we were to substitute these values in, then the graph of the resulting quadratic would look something like that. It's going to just touch the x-axis at the value, uh, at whatever value. It's not necessarily uh, at 4. So this would be the graph of y equals x squared plus 4x plus uh, 4. Okay, so that's us done with polynomials and linear relations. We're now going to move on to something almost completely different. We're going to look at transformations. So basically, the idea behind transformations is that you can manipulate the equation of a graph. So say we have the graph of a quadratic like we've got in front of us here, and we multiply the entire equation by 2. What would that do to the resulting graph? How would it transform? So that's what we're going to be looking at, as well as how do we apply transformations to a particular graph that we want to transform in a particular way. Now, there's three different types of transformations. The first you can see on the left there is reflections. So this is where you, uh, you have the graph and you have a particular axis that you're reflecting on. And so you basically just take the graph and you flip it onto the other side of that axis. That's reflections. The second is dilations. So with dilations, 
It's essentially stretching or squeezing the graph, uh, again, along a particular axis. And then the final form of transformation is translation, where you're taking that graph and you're not stretching or squeezing or flipping it. You're just moving the graph to a different part of the Cartesian plane. So first of all, we have to understand what it is that we're doing to the equation of a particular graph with these transformations. So with the dilation, we're always dilating by a particular factor, first of all. It could be, you know, a number like two or three. And if we're dilating by a factor of two, that means that the uh, graph is going to get stretched by a factor of two. So it's going to basically double in length, if you want to think of it that way. You can also dilate by a fraction. So if a factor is like half, then that means we're squishing the graph in by a factor of two because one over two half one thing you want to know about each of these forms of transformations is how it's going to affect either the x or y values so if we dilate by a factor from the y-axis so that's the axis going vertically across the screen uh, then we need to think about what that means it essentially means we're stretching the graph out this way we're dilating it away from the y-axis. So what ends up happening is each point along the graph moves horizontally because we're stretching, but it doesn't move vertically, which means that the x values are going to change, but not the y values. We'll get into more of what it actually means for the x values to change uh, later. But just know if you're dilating in the y-axis, the x values change. And then similarly, if you're dilating from the x-axis, then every y value uh, along every every point's y value on the graph is going to change because if we're dialing from the x-axis we're going to be stretching so every point's going to be moving vertically but not horizontally uh, reflections are pretty similar if you reflect in the y-axis so again thinking about what that means graphically you've got the y-axis here we have a graph here and we reflect in the y-axis so all those y values how far up or down it is stay the same, but those x values get inverted. Uh, and that's the same thing with the x-axis. We have the x-axis here, we're reflecting there uh, in that axis, then the x values are gonna stay the same, but the y values get inverted. Translations are different. They're much more intuitive in the sense that if you translate in a particular direction, in a particular axis, then you're gonna affect that axis uh, values. So if we were to translate a graph up or down, then the y values are going to get affected. And it's very intuitive. And the same thing with the x direction. If we uh, translate a graph left or right, then it's going to affect the x values, but not the y values. Okay, so keep that in mind. Dilations and reflections, if you perform it in one axis, the other uh, axis is set of values get affected, whereas translation, it's the same axis. Uh, I've just got a quick question for you all here that you can kind of think about. Why do we generally do translations after dilations and reflections when transforming? Um, now, I think this question is good because it will give us an opportunity to really visualize this a little bit better. So. There's this rule of thumb in when it comes to transformations that you want to do dilations, then reflections, and then finally transformations. We'll get into that in the next slide, but it's always this order and not the other way around. The reason for that is because if we just take a random graph, let's say we have this kind of graph here, where it's just a scribble in the top right half of the graph. Um, if we dilate that, so let's say we're stretching it away from the y-axis, it's going to look something like that. That's where we get to. And then we translate it. Then we can kind of generally in our head think about what the resulting shape is going to be. So first we do the dilation and then the transformation. 
But if we were to translate it first and then do the dilation, then it would be a little bit tough. Let's say instead that we've got the same graph. Let's say that we translate it in the direction of the x-axis first, or in the direction of the y-axis, along the x-axis, but in the direction of the y-axis. If we move it this way, we're going to end up with something like that. And then dilating that is going to get very confusing for us to keep track of, especially, especially for bigger, more complex graphs that you might encounter. It's just gen generally easier to understand the dilation if it's done first. So the answer here is D. Another valid answer though, translations are affected by the other transformation. So the answer is also B. And you can see that because if we do a dilation and then a transformation, the dilation doesn't get affected by that transformation. But if we do the translation first, then the dilation ends up with, and then the dilation, we end up with a completely different graph. So that's the order there, dilations, reflections, translations. And there's the reason for why it is. We already went over that. Okay, so let's say we have an equation. Let's say we have y equals x squared plus 4. And we want to perform a translation. Or we want not just a translation. We want to perform a transformation on it. So what we do is we use the coordinate method. This method is really good because it'll allow you to set out the steps and just th show very thorough working out. It'll allow for no room of error when it comes to successfully performing the transformation on that graph of y equals x squared plus 4. So the first thing that in it involves is specifying your translation uh, in this form right here. So we have, first of all, x comma y. This is basically representing every point on the original graph, the graph that hasn't been transformed yet. So let's say we have y equals x squared plus 4. Every point along that graph, we're expressing it using this notation here, x comma y. Then if we want to perform a dilation A, so a dilation of factor A from the y-axis, and a dilation of factor B from the x-axis, we're then taking every point on that graph and we're multiplying it by that factor. So we get AX comma BY. Then if we want to reflect it in the X and Y axes, we put a negative sign out the front and that'll invert every value. And so you'll get a reflection in the X axis and the Y axis as well. And then the final thing is if you want to translate by um, an amount C up and an amount D right, or in the event that you want to translate down and left, you would do uh, minus D and minus C. So you can pick and choose which transformations you want to do. Say I just wanted to dilate from by factor A and then move the graph D units right, then that would look like X comma Y. First we do our dilation. So remember, uh, our dilation from the, X, uh, from the Y axis affects the X values. So we have AX comma Y, and then we translate D units to the right. So we get AX plus D, Y. That's our, uh, well, that's the end of our working there. What this final set of coordinates gives us here is every point on the transformed graph. But how do we find the equation of that transformed graph given this information? What we then do, and I'll just get rid of my scribbles here. Uh, there we go. So what we do is we first try to label every coordinate on the transformed graph. We're going to label it x dash and y dash. 
And so because we've done all of this working here to show what the coordinates of the transformed graph are in terms of our original points x comma y, we actually get two expressions that we can form. So the x coordinate of the transformed graph is negative ax plus d. The y coordinate is negative by plus c. The only thing is we need to, we have the equation of the original graph uh, and we need to substitute some, some kind of expression in which gives us the equation of the transformed graph. But the issue is with our original equation, it's expressed in terms of x and y. Uh, but these equations here, we've got x dash and y dash isolated on one side, and then we've got an expression for each of them on the right. So what we actually have to do is rearrange these expressions so that we get x and y on one side, and then uh, some expression in terms of x dash and in terms of y dash on the other side. We can then take this and substitute it successfully back into our uh, original equation. And that'll look something like that. Okay, so we've got an opportunity here to practice the coordinate method a little bit. Uh, say we have a graph, uh, y equals 1 over x, and we have this set of transformations. We then need to state the transformed function g of x. So what we're going to do is, first of all, we need to condense all of these steps down into the notation that we discussed earlier. So we start off with x comma y. Uh, we're dilating by a factor of 2 from the y-axis and a factor of 6 from the x-axis. So that would look like well, y-axis, we're affecting the x value, so we get 2x. And then x-axis, we're dilating by a factor of 6, so that would be 6y. So remember, you dilate in one axis, you affect the values of the other axis. Uh, then moving on, we reflect in the x-axis, so that affects the y values. So we get 2x, and then we put a minus sign, 6y. That's just inverting all of the y values so that we reflect it in the x-axis. Uh, the final thing is that we translate one unit up and half a unit right. So remember with translation, it affects the same axis. So if we're dilating up, any vertical movement is expressed uh, in terms of the y direction. So we're going to get 2x plus something, we're going to get negative 6y plus 1. So that's the movement up, and then the movement right is just going to be plus half uh, in the x-axis. So we now have this. What we can then do is we know that our transformed function has the coordinates x dash and y dash. So we can form an expression. x dash is equal to 2x plus half because these two are the exact same set of coordinates, and y dash is negative 6y plus 1. We can then do a little bit of a rearranging. So moving the half to the other side would get a minus sign, and then dividing everything by 2, we would get x is equal to, uh, what is that? x dash minus half over 2, and same thing with y we would get y minus 1 divided by negative 6. So y minus 1 over 6 with the negative sign out the front. Um, that's a dash there. Okay. So we have our equation here. y is equal to 1 over x. We can substitute these expressions in now. So we get negative y dash minus 1 over 6. That's our expression for y is equal to 1 over x dash minus half over 2. Uh, that's all over 2. So now we can just simplify a little bit. We're going to get 2 over x dash minus half. Oh, that is it's not a half. There we go. Minus half. And then multiply both sides by negative 6 and add 1. So we get y dash on one side going to end up with y equals uh, 
it's going to be, what's that? Two, yeah, so we'll get negative 12 over x dash minus half. And then we've got the plus one. Uh, and then finally, we can simplify using one last step and just multiplying the top and bottom by two so that we get it into this form that they require. So we're going to get y is equal to uh, y dash is equal to negative 24 over 2x minus 1 plus 1. So I just multiply the top and bottom by 2. That'll change this half into a 1. And now we have it in the form that they want. Negative a over bx plus c plus d. I've got negative 24 over 2x minus 1 plus 1. Okay, so that's the coordinate method. You can see we're laying out every step sequentially. And so it's very hard for errors to occur. There is this thing called the replacement method, though, uh, which is quite a lot faster. But not only does it require more memorization, but it requires a lot more familiarity with the way each of the numbers interact in an equation to yield a particular graph. Um, you can see here, this is basically the gist of the uh, replacement method where if we're doing a dilation A from the y-axis, uh, B from the x-axis, reflection X and Y axes, translation C up and D right, you can actually just substitute the values straight into the equation of the graph and get to the transformed graph. This is really risky though, because there's a lot of like double negatives and stuff going on. For instance, if we dilate by a factor of A from the y-axis, you would expect us to be multiplying, but instead we're dividing. But then if we're translating C up, uh, that follows the rules we'd expect. We're adding a value of C. But then if we're translating D to the right, we're actually minusing by D. So it can get pretty confusing, but once you kind of remember that this series of transformations corresponds exactly to this uh, change in the equation of the original graph, then you can start using the replacement method a lot more in your, in your working. So we'll practice that here. The function f of x equals 1 over x undergoes the following transformations. It's the exact same set of transformations. We just want to use the replacement method now. So what I'm going to actually do is go back to the original, oh, the previous slide here. Um, change back to my pen here. So we've got the graph y equals 1 over x. And just looking at our set of dilations, 2 from y and 6 from x, reflection in the x-axis, translation 1 up and half right. So the dilation 2 from y and 6 from x, that's going to look like uh, a equals 2. So this would be 2. Uh, factor of 6 from x is going to look like, that's going to be 6. That's B. Uh, then we also have the reflection in the x-axis. So if we're reflecting in the x-axis, then that's going to mean this negative sign right here at the front. So we're going to keep that negative sign. Since we're not reflecting the y-axis, we're going to get rid of this sign. Uh, and then the final thing we're going to do is translate C units up and D right. What are we dealing with? One unit up and half units right. Okay. So one unit up is going to be, where's my pen going? There it is. This is going to be one. And D units right, this is going to be half. So our transformed graph is going to look like y equals negative 6. And then we've got the function. This is the notation for the function. Uh, in this case, the function is 1 over x. So we've got 1 over x minus half all over 2 uh, and then plus 1. And then we can just simplify that. 
and eventually we'll get to the same answer. So that's going to be, we flip this around, negative six over two times x minus half plus one, and then uh, that's going to be negative 12 x dash minus half plus one. And then finally, we just wanna get it into the same form that they asked for. Yeah, it's the same form as before. So multiply the top and bottom of this fraction by two, we get negative uh, 24 over two x dash minus one plus one. That's our transformed graph equation there. Okay, so you can see it's pretty complicated. Um, yeah, and again, it requires a very strong familiarity of exactly how these, or well, this formula here at the bottom here, negative b times f of x minus d over a plus c, exactly how that relates to the transformations you're doing. But as you practice the coordinate method more and more and more, you'll get more and more familiar with uh, how to use the replacement method to cut out a lot of uh, working and save a lot of time. So we'll move on now. Uh, that's it for transformations. We're going to move on to inverse functions. So a one-to-one -one function is a function where no y value repeats. What we can do is use this thing called the horizontal line test to determine if a function is one-to-one. -one. So what we're looking for when we do this horizontal line test is a function should never touch the line twice. Otherwise, it's not a one-to-one -one function. So you can see here in this graph, no matter where we put a horizontal line, it's only ever going to intersect the graph once for each horizontal life line we put down. So that means that this function, we can call it one-to-one. -one. Uh, then you can look at this graph here. If we, no matter where we put a uh, line, horizontal line, it's going to touch the well, it's going to intersect the graph multiple times. Now, even you might have a graph that looks something like this, where if you put a horizontal line here, it only intersects once. But if there's any point along the graph where if you put a horizontal line and it touches it, it touches the graph more than once, then that graph isn't one to one. So you can see how that connects with this idea of no y value repeating. Because here you can see if we take x equals. Well, if we take y equals 2, that's occurring multiple times. It's occurring here, it's occurring here, it's occurring here. But then if we take y equals 2 here, it only occurs at this one place here. So that's one-to-one -one functions. And the reason it's important, uh, we'll find out a little bit later, but it connects to this idea of inverse functions. So what is an inverse function now? This is a function that's denoted f to the negative 1. Um, and the way you would show that in your notation is y equals f to the negative one of x. So that's the same as saying something like y equals f of x. If we want to describe the inverse of this, then we write y equals f to the negative one of x. The property of this inverse function is that it basically undoes the operation of the function that it's inverse to. So what does that mean? Let's say if we take any value, I'm going to call this value x, and then we apply a function f to it. Let's say, for the sake of an example, let's say that we, this function f is equal to x squared. What we're doing is we're taking that value x to a new value, which is represented by f of x. So let's say x is equal to 2. By applying the function f, we're going to go to, uh, what is that? We're going to go to, well, 2 squared, which is 4. What the inverse function does is it undoes the operation of the function that we just applied. So it'll take the value back from f of x to x. In this case, we've got 4. We The inverse function of x squared is going to be the function that takes this value 4 as an input and then outputs back 2. In this case, you'll probably already be familiar with the inverse function of x squared. That's going to be the square root sign. In this case, f of x, or we want to write f inverse of x is 
uh, square root of x. And sure enough, if we put in 4 as the input, so f inverse 4 is our input, then we're going to be doing square root of 4, and that's going to take us back to 2. So that's the thing you want to remember. It takes, for any given function, the inverse function is going to just do the reverse of what the function does. It's going to undo what the function does. I've expressed that mathematically here. It has the property that f inverse of f of x is going to give us back x. So we have x, we're putting it into the function, so now we have a value f of x, and then we're taking that value and putting it into the inverse function, and that's going to spit back out the original x that we put in. It also has a geometric meaning along with a mathematical meaning. The graphs of f and f inverse are related by reflection along the line y equals x. So we looked at reflections just before, where we reflected it along the x and y axes. This time you can just think about taking one of those axes and rotating it 45 degrees. We get this line y equals x, and we're reflecting along there to get the inverse. The reason we were looking at one-to-one -one graphs originally is because you can only have, well, a graph can only have an inverse if it's a one-to-one -one function. And there's a reason for that. We'll look into that a little bit later. But principally, you want to, whenever you think about inverse functions and finding an inverse function, you want to think, first of all, is the graph one-to-one? -one? Is the equation a one-to-one -one function? So the thing is, there's a lot of graphs that aren't one-to-one, -one, right? For instance, just take a parabola. We can use that horizontal line test. And if we draw the horizontal line right here, we can see that it intersects at two points as opposed to one. So it's not a one-to-one -one function. But we can do something called restricting the function Ugh. restricting the function's domain. Uh, now the domain is basically what it means is the all the x values that you can put into the function and get a y value out. In this case, we're looking at this function here. We can put in any value for x, no matter how small, how big, and we'll get some y value out. Uh, let's say we put in 100,000 for x, we'll get 100,000 squared. So we still get a valid y value. We can restrict the domain, so say in this case we're restricting it so that we can only put in x values going from 0 to infinity, and that'll essentially chop off this left half of the graph. And now the graph is one-to-one. -one. Wherever we put a horizontal line, uh, it'll only ever intersect once. So what if the function isn't one-to-one -one and we try and take the inverse of it? We can see here, again, we won't use the mathematical definition of the inverse. We'll think about it graphically. If we had a function, let's say a parabola, that's not one-to-one. -one. And then we try and find the inverse. We'd find that by reflecting along the line y equals x. So we get this function out here. The issue with this function is it's not really... Well, it isn't a function anymore because the definition of a function is you can put in an x value and you'll only get one y value out. In the case of a parabola, this is a function because if we put in x equals 2, we only get one y value out. If we get x, if we put in x equals 5, we'll only get one y value out somewhere up here. For this function, if we put in x equals 5, we're going to get two y values out. Uh, and by definition of what a function is, this isn't a function anymore. So because we want the inverse to be a function, that's why we call it an inverse function, we need to make sure that every graph that we're taking the inverse of is one-to-one. -one. Okay, so to find an inverse function, this is the series of steps that you want to follow, and make sure that you follow these almost verbatim. So always write let y equals fx for your first step. Write two inverts, swap x and y uh, as your second step. Um, that's the first thing. You always want to follow these steps verbatim because Vika is very strict about making sure that you show you're working in this series of steps. The second thing you want to do is before you do any of this, uh, make sure that the function you're dealing with is one-to-one -one because if it's not, then you're going to run into issues. Um, okay.
So those are steps there. Uh, but obviously it doesn't help to see the steps. It's better to do it with an example. Let's take this function here. We have g of x is equal to 4x minus 3 uh, over x minus 1. We want to find the rule of g inverse. So the first step, as we saw in the previous slide, let y equals f of x. Um, we're going to write that down. Let y equal 4x minus 3 over x minus 1. So that's our, in this case, we're dealing with g of x, and our expression for g of x is this. So that's our first line of working. Uh, the next thing we're going to do is um, to, we're going to write two inverts, swap x and y. Swap x and y. So that's the second step there. And then we go ahead and swap X and Y and then rearrange to make Y the subject. So we're going to do this X. So X is now in place of Y equals four Y minus three over Y minus one. So we've just swapped X and Y and now we want to rearrange to get Y on its own. So what I can do is we can swap these two it's just a little uh, trick you can do with your working out. You get y minus 1 equals 4y minus 3 over x. Um, okay. All right. No, this isn't going to lead anywhere. What we can do, because we can see here that uh, if we go ahead with this, there's there's no way to actually get y on its own by just multiplying and rearranging. We need to do something to this fraction itself so that we get rid of this bottom part that has x in it. Um, or we get rid of the top part of the fraction that has x in it. So I'm going to undo all that. Uh, and you should take note as well, this is something that you can do if you're dealing with a fraction involving x on both sides and uh, on both the top and bottom and uh, you can't really get anywhere when you're using it in your working out. What we can do is we can extend this line of working. We're going to write 4x minus 4 plus 1. Yeah, so we're going to write 4x minus 4 plus 1. That should be it all over x minus 1. We can then split this up. So we get 4x minus 4 plus 1. And then both of those are over x minus 1. So <clears throat> I'm just rearranging the way, well, not rearranging, rewriting this expression here um, for g of x. And you'll notice that what I've done by rewriting the top as 4x minus 4 is I can actually factor out a 4 in the top line and then we'll end up with x minus 1 over x minus 1 and then plus 1 over x minus 1 and then this will these two will cancel out so we'll get 4 plus 1 over x minus 1 this is much easier now to work with so again to, to invert we swap x and y so we'll go x is equal to 4 plus 1 over y minus 1. Uh, move the 4 to the other side. x minus 4 is equal to 1 over y. Well, it's supposed to be a minus 1. And then swap these two. So we get y minus 1 is equal to 1 over x minus 4. And then just add 1 to both sides. So y is equal to 1 over x minus 4 plus 1. Okay, so that's the equation of the inverse, but we have to specifically state uh, the equation itself. So we have g inverse. We need to use that notation. So I'll write that here. Therefore, g inverse of x is equal to 1 over x minus 4 plus 1. That's how we find the inverse there. Here's another question. Consider the function h, x squared minus 2x plus 3, 
we need to find the rule for h inverse, the inverse function of h. Okay, so again, we want to write let y equal to f of x. Oh, in this case, f of x is h of x, which is uh, y equals x squared minus 2x plus 3. And then we write 2 invert swap x and y. All right, so we now have x is equal to y squared minus 2y plus 3. Okay, so with this one, it's a quadratic, so we have to be more careful about how we go about finding y. Uh, what we can do is, with quadratics, we can convert them to stationary point form, and then we'll just have an expression where we have some instance of y, and then all, all this like algebraic fluff, algebraic fluff around it, where we can just rearrange all of it and get y on its own again. So, um, in this case, we've got y squared minus 2y plus 3. Again, to convert to stationary point form, the first thing we do is we figure out what b over 2 squared is. So b over 2 squared, in this case, b is negative 2. So we have negative 2 over 2 squared. That's going to be negative 1 squared, which is 1. So we write y, we write y squared minus 2y plus 1 minus 1 plus 3. Uh, these three terms become a perfect square. So y squared is one term, 2y another, and 1 is our last one. They're going to condense to become y plus b over 2 squared. Well, y plus b over 2. In this case, b over 2 is negative 2 over 2. So that's y minus 1 squared. And then we've got minus 1 plus 3 on the outside. So that's just going to be 2. Okay, so we've got this. And now we can rearrange for y. So we get x minus 2 equals y minus 1 squared. And now we run into a bit of an issue because if we take the square root, let's go ahead and do that, we're going to get a plus and minus equals y minus 1. Um, now what does this mean? Essentially what it means is if we plug in an x value, then we're going to get two different values for y. And remember, by definition of a function, that means that what we've got here is no longer a function. So we need to essentially pick, are we going to take the positive branch of the square root of the negative branch or the negative branch? How can we find this out? The way we can find it out is by looking at the original question. We have uh, a function going from one to infinity. That's the X values that we can put into this equation. Uh, and then we've got the actual equation itself. So what would this look like graphically? We know that a parabola has this kind of shape. Um, and we know that it's going from one to infinity, which probably means that we're cutting it off somewhere around here. So none of this part of the graph is here. We only have this part. So if we were thinking about, well, if we were picking the positive branch of this expression down here for the inverse, then we draw the line y equals x. Forgive the terrible drawings there. Um, if we were to reflect the negative branch in the line y equals x, then we're going to end up with something like this. Uh, one thing you should know about square root graphs, so graphs which have this kind of uh, this kind of shape, y, well, this kind of form, y equals square root of x, they have this kind of shape where they go up and then they kind of taper out over time. If we were to apply a transformation to that where we flip it in the x-axis, that's the x-axis there, um, then we would get something like that. If you notice here, that's what we're doing. If we select the negative branch, we're putting a negative sign out front of this uh, square root graph or the square root uh, equation here. So we would be getting something like this. But notice we're not taking the negative branch of 
the original graph here. We're not taking this branch here, we're taking this branch here from going from one all the way to infinity. So that means we want to take the positive branch, which is this. Um, so what we can do, we can write, but uh, one is smaller than y is smaller than infinity. And then you can write therefore root x minus two is equal to y minus one. So this is enough, just saying, but one equal is one is smaller than y is smaller than infinity. This is enough to explain your choice for selecting the positive branch. And then of course you can get rid of the plus or minus sign. We've selected the positive branch there. And then you can just go ahead and finish solving for y. So we get y equals root x minus two uh, minus uh, plus one. And then we answer the question. H inverse is equal to square root of x minus two plus one. Okay, so that's it for inverse functions. You just need to be able to know how to find an inverse function, as well as kind of get familiar with the fact that the inverse function is any function that's reflected in the line y equals x, uh, as well as the inverse function is a function that undoes the operation of a given function. We're going to finish off now with probability. Um, yeah, there's quite a lot to cover here too, but it's the last section. So thank you all for hanging around until now. We're almost there. Okay. So we'll start off with considering a scenario. We're going to roll a fair six sided dice. Now the rolling of the die is what we call a random experiment. We don't know what the outcome of the experiment is going to be. Uh, and the reason we're calling it an experiment is because we're essentially, well, we're performing some kind of test, some kind of operation where we're rolling a die and seeing what happens. Uh, then in terms of, referring to each number on the die that could well each number represents a different outcome so we have six different outcomes on a fair six-sided die uh, either we have one uh, we either we roll a one that's one outcome or we roll a two that's another so on and so forth uh, so that's what we call an outcome and then if we take the full collection of outcomes then we get what's called the sample space so it's the set of all possible outcomes. One, two, three, four, five, and six in this case. Uh, we'll go a little bit into this, what we call set notation here. But what you should know is when you have a list of numbers separated by commas and bracketed by these curly brackets, that's the mat mathematical way of denoting a set. Uh, again, we'll get into that a little bit later, like the notation and everything. Okay, so a drawer contains three red socks and two blue socks. If two socks are taken from the drawer without replacement, so we take them out and then we don't put them back, what is the sample space? Okay, so let's consider what could happen. What are all the possibilities that could happen? That's what the sample space is asking for. The first thing that could happen is we reach in and we pull out a red sock. And then we reach in again we pull out another red sock. So now we've picked out two socks. The experiment is over. That's an outcome. We either pick two red socks. Uh, the second thing that could happen, the second outcome, is we could reach in and pick out a red sock. Or we could reach in and pick out a blue sock. So that's another outcome. A red sock and then a blue sock. Same, same uh, logic applies to the other two outcomes that are possible. Either we pick out a blue sock and then a red sock, or we pick out two blue socks. So let's say a red sock is denoted by R and a blue sock is denoted by B. Then the set of all possible outcomes is going to be, remember we use the curly brackets, either red and red again, or blue and red, or red and blue, or blue and blue. Okay, so an outcome is a possible result of a random experiment. What we can do is we can group these different outcomes together 
and we can then refer to that as an event. So even like thinking back to the sample space, the sample space is also an event because it's a group of all possible outcomes. Uh, but we can also just take a subset of those possible outcomes. Uh, in the case of our scenario here, we've got one, two, three, four, five, six as the sample space. We could refer to the event of rolling an even number as um, having the sample space two, four, and six. So this idea of an event, just know that it's a group of possible outcomes and you can express it also as a set. Okay, a fair six-sided dice is rolled, a die is rolled. Let's let A be the event in which an odd number is rolled and B be the event in which a number less than five is rolled. So now, as we know with events, you can uh, well, you can label them uh, with sets. So what is the set of A going to be? Well, it's, we're looking for all the odd numbered outcomes. So A is going to be the set containing the numbers one, that's odd, three, that's also odd, and five, that's odd. So that's, that's the set of A. That's all odd numbered possible outcomes. B is the set of outcomes where uh, a number less than five is rolled. So one is less than five, so we can put that in the set for B. Same with two, same with three, and same with four. Five is obviously not less than five, so we don't include that in the set. Okay. Now this is set notation. Uh, we're going to be using this a bit more throughout the subsequent slides. Uh, there's quite a lot to look at here, but over time, as you do more and more probability questions, you'll become more familiar with it. Uh, as we go through this, the slides anyways, I'll continually remind you what each of these uh, signs mean so that you're not left in the dark. First of all, we have an upside down U shape. This is an intersection. What it means is an intersection. So if we have two events, and we're looking for the intersection between them, we're looking for all the outcomes that are in both A and B. So we'll, we'll actually, we'll do a couple examples later on, but then the way you would notate that is A and then the upside down U shape and then B. It just goes ahead and uh, condenses this long sentence here into just this short little expression here. Uh, union is an upside down U. Now, this is a little bit different from intersection. We're looking for all the outcomes that are in A or B. So if it's in A, but it's not in B, it's still part of this set here, A union B. If it's in both A and B, then it's in this set A union B, as well as this set A intersect B. Okay, now the dash means complement. So if we take an event and we put a dash next to it, we're talking about all the outcomes that are not in that given set. So A dash is a complement. That's the list of outcomes that are not in A. So in our previous example, we saw that A is all the odd numbered events. A dash would be the set two, four, and six. Um, some other things that you may need to know uh, based on the question that you asked. First of all, you have the null set. So this is the set that has nothing in it, which kind of seems useless at first, but as you do more probability questions, you'll start to find that it's some pretty useful notation. Uh, this is probably least used, to be honest. And then you also have uh, epsilon, which is probably used a little bit more than the null set, uh, and sometimes used to list the entire sample space of a random experiment. So. Uh, if I was to go back to our scenario with the six sided dice, I've said here that the possible outcomes are one, two, three, four, five, and six. We can also just say epsilon is equal to one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay. So, uh, we've got a question here and this will allow us to just practice a bit more of that set notation. First of all, we have A upside down U. So remember that's intersection. There's a top line there. B. So we're looking for all the values that are in both A as well as B. 
Okay. So A is the set 1, 3, 5. B is the set 1, 2, 3, 4. We can see that 1 is in A and B. So that's part of the set. We can write A union B. We can start our list off with 1. 2 isn't, so that doesn't go on the list. 3 is, so that can go on our list. And then 4 and 5 uh, are unique to one set only. So this is the entire set, A intersection B. Moving on to B here, we now have A union B. So remember, that's where uh, we're looking for all the outcomes that are in either one set or in both. So in this case, usually these tend to be a bit longer sets. So we can see 1, 3, and 5 are in A, and then 1, 2, 3, 4 are in B. So we can just write all those numbers down. So 1, 2, 3, 4, and then 5. Every single number that I've written down here is either in B, or it's either in A, or it's in both of them. Uh, and then finally, we have A complement. So uh, A is 1, 3, 5. Our entire sample set is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So remember A complement, we're looking for the values that aren't in A. So 1, 3, and 5 are in A, so we want to avoid those. So it's not these ones. We're looking at the leftovers, 2, 4, and 6. Okay, cool. Now, Venn diagrams are very useful, especially when it comes to dealing with two different sets like, we're, like we are here. Uh, Venn diagrams are a great way of visualizing that and just clearing up a lot of confusion with the that might be introduced with the uh, set notation, like the intersection sign, union sign, etc., etc. So we can represent A and B like this. Uh, this might be something that you're familiar with as well if you've covered probability in your class before. So all of the values that, or all of the outcomes that are in A, we're going to put within this circle right here. Let me get my mouse back up. There you go. This highlighted circle here. Any outcome that's part of the set, uh, part of the event A, we're going to put in this circle. Uh, that's the same with B. Now A intersect B, we're looking at the values that are in both A and B not the ones that are also only in A or also only in B, both A and B. So that's going to be the intersection, literally, as you can see in the diagram. Now, if we're looking at A complement intersect B, first of all, A complement is everything outside the bubble that we're using to represent A. So if I could just color the entire screen in here and leave the bubble A white, that's A complement. And then we're looking at where that overlaps or intersects with B. In this case, it's going to be every part of B that doesn't include A itself. That's A complement uh, intersection B. All right, now we have A union B, and that's any value that's either in A and B, or just in A, or just in B. One thing that we can start doing here is start discovering these little formulas that connect um, the concepts of union and intersection and some other probability concepts, which we'll go into later. This formula right here is called the addition rule. And it might not make sense at first, but if we look at everything graphically or well, visually, uh, it'll start to make more sense. So we know that the probability of A union B is this entire yellow shaded area here. The probability of A is if we just shaded in this yellow bubble, and then the probability of B is if we just shaded in this uh, B bubble. So if we were to add those together, then we'll th add those two bubbles together, like we're doing in this first part of the formula, we're going to end up with this overlapping region here. So if we minus that out, which is, remember, this overlapping region is A intersect B, then we're going to end up overall with A union B. I'm not sure if I've explained that well. Um, it is tough to visualize. Uh, even if you don't understand it now, over time, you'll slowly come to terms with it. All right. We also have this idea of mutual exclusivity. So if we don't have A and B overlapping, so that means that there's no part of A that's also a part of B. That is the intersection of A and B. So that's the overlap between A and B is part of the empty set. So it has no elements. 
essentially it doesn't exist, uh, then that means that the events A and B are mutually exclusive. Uh, so you might, you might have a question in the textbook asking you, are A and B mutually exclusive? And you'll just have to use your knowledge of the sets A and B to prove that A and B are part of the empty set or the probability of A intersect B is zero. Um, okay, there's a depiction of what I mean by mutually exclusive. They clearly don't overlap. Okay. Uh, you can also just have a box around this entire thing, which will allow you to represent outcomes that aren't part of A or B. Uh, and you would just leave them in this little space outside the Venn diagram, but still within this yellow box. Okay, so here's some practice. It's the same scenario as before, but this time we're putting everything into a Venn diagram. So I'll draw my first bubble. This is A, and then that's B. Okay. So 1 and 3 are in both A and B. So I'll put 1 and 3 here. Uh, 5 is only in A, so I'll put 5 here. 2 and 4 are only in B, so I'll put 2 and 4 in just B. And then we also have six, just kind of an outsider. So we'll put that there. We can then put a box around everything and that is the question complete. So there's some, prob uh, some properties that you should know about probabilities. First of all, first rule here, this is kind of the definition of probability here. Um, the probability of an outcome is the number of favorable outcomes over the total number of total outcomes. Mathematically, that's how de probability is defined. Um, but this kind of just follows from common sense, right? Like if you uh, can, if you can score a goal 50 out of 100 times, then odds are that it takes that you have 50% odds of scoring a goal the next time you kick the ball. That's just how probability works. Uh, this next point here, the probability of an outcome is always between zero and one. So it's always a decimal or a fraction that never goes above one. Uh, in the scenario with kicking a goal um, or scoring a goal, the probability was 50%, which you can also represent as half. Uh, okay, and then the last thing is the sum of all the different outcomes in the sample space is going to be equal to one. Now one represents a, a hundred percent probability of something happening. So it would make sense for every element in the sample space to like for their probabilities to add together to be one, because in the end, if you conduct the experiment, you're going to a hundred percent be guaranteed to get an outcome. It doesn't matter what that outcome is. Um, so these three rules, it's, a good general rule to remember both for one and two, and you'll find it coming in useful for three and four as well. Okay, using the same Venn diagram as before, you need to calculate F, G, and well, the probability of F, probability of G, and then the probability of F intersect G. So these numbers, just think of them as outcomes. Uh, we're going to go ahead and start our working here. The probability of F, first of all, we have one, two, three, four, five, six outcomes in F. And then in total, we have seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20 outcomes in the sample space. So using that first rule at the top there, favorable outcomes over total outcomes, our probability of F is going to be by definition, uh, six number of elements in F, over 20, number of elements in the sample space. Uh, that would simplify to three over 10. Uh, and what you'll notice about that result as well is it satisfies the second outcome, or the second point there as well, that every single outcome has a probability between zero and one. Okay, uh, the probability of G, you can use the same logic. We've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight outcomes in G, so we do 8 over 20, which simplifies to 2 over 5. Uh, just dividing the top and bottom of the fraction by 4. And then last of all, we have probability of F intersect G. Oh, here we go. Okay. F intersect G, we only have one element in that set. 
So again, intersect means we're looking for the overlap between F and G. So that's just three. Um, in this case, that's only one outcome out of 20. So that's going to be our odds there. Without looking at the diagram, we need to calculate this. Okay, so we don't have the diagram. That means we need to use some kind of formula. And remember, we looked at the addition formula beforehand, which stated that this is going to be equal to the probability of F plus the probability of G minus the probability of F intersect G. Okay, so the probability of F was 3 over 10, probability of G is 2 over 5, and then that of F intersect G is 1 over 20. So this would then be 3 over 10 plus 2 over 5 minus 1 over 20, which is going to be, we'll write everything with a common denominator, 6 over 20 plus, uh, what is that, 8 over 20 minus 1 over 20. 6 plus 8 minus 1 is 13, so we get 13 over 20. That's our answer. Okay, knowing that one event has occurred affects the probability that another event has also occurred. This is the idea of conditional probability. So, and you'll find this, you know, in many different situations in life. Um, for instance, if one day it rains, it's probably going to rain the next day, right? Because the storm's still around, the, the rain clouds are going to stick around for another day, most likely. Uh, and then even in more, in less probabilistic scenarios, like if a card drawn from a deck is black, there's going to be a higher chance that that it is spades than before. And that's just due to the fact that you only have 52 cards in the deck. Um, okay. So this idea that one uh, event happening affects the probabilities of the other event is what we refer to as this idea of conditional probability. And the way we can express it is using this notation here. Oh, okay. So the probability of A, given that B already happened, that's what this means. And we have a formula here for it too. It's given by the probability of A intersect B over the probability of B. So that's just a formula that you should, you'll have to accept over time. Um, I'm not sure if we have a derivation for it later in the slides. If we do though, that'll be good because it'll be easier to remember this formula. But this is how we express the probability of A given that B already has happened. So if we're talking about it raining the next day and B meaning that it rained today, then uh, the probability of A given that B already happened would be us looking at the probability of raining tomorrow given that it's already rained today. Uh, another way of displaying probability information is by using this thing called a uh, Karnoff map. I'm not exactly sure how to pronounce it. It's also called a probability table. This is what I refer to it as. Um, and you can see here, we've just in the columns and the rows, we've laid out the probabilities of A and B happening together or A and not B happening together or not A and B happening together or neither of them happening together. You can see that if you sum along the uh, along the rows here, then you get the probability of A and the probability of A complement. The sum along the columns, you get the probability of B and the probability of B complement. And then if you sum along the, the final column and the final row, you'll get one. And that's just because if you add up the probability of A happening and A not happening, obviously that's going to refer to all outcomes. And so that's just going to have a probability of one. Same with the probability of B and B complement. Okay, so in terms of applying the probability table that we just looked at, uh, you kind of learn through more and more questions when it's going to come in useful. This is the characteristic kind of question where you're going to end up having to use a probability table. So it says the probability that Cynthia walks to school and it's raining is 0 0.1. The probability that it doesn't rain is 0 0.6. And the probability that Cynthia walks is 0 0.7. So, okay, the question tells us using a kind of map, what is the probability that on any given day she doesn't walk and it isn't raining? But even if you weren't given that last sentence, 
this sentence over as you do more and more questions over time you'll know immediately oh okay i need to use a probability table so uh let's lay out the information we have uh yeah there we go so first off we'll fill in the information we know probability cynthia walks to school when it's raining so she walks to school when it's raining that's an intersection of those two events i'm going to put 0 0.1 in this box right here the probability that it doesn't rain is 0 0.6 so the probability of rain complement so not raining remember we go all the way to the end this is going to be the probability that it doesn't rain that's going to be 0 0.6 the probability that cynthia walks is 0 0.7 so cynthia walking is represented by w we go all the way down to the bottom this is going to be the probability of w and we put a 0 0.7 there so forget about all these other values that we've written down we know that this box is 0 0.1 this box is 0 0.6 this box is 0 0.7 and this box is 1. We don't have these five values here, 0 0.4, 0 0.3, 0, 0 0.3, and 0 0.6. We don't know those yet, but we can just fill in the gaps, right? We know that 0 0.1 plus whatever's in this box has to give us 0 0.7. And so that number in this box has to be 0 0.6 so that these add together accordingly. Same with uh, this column here. We have 0 0.6 and 1 here, so that means this number has to be 0 0.4 so that they add together to give 1. And then that allows us to fill in this box, and then that will allow us to fill in the subsequent box uh, boxes. Now to answer the question, it's raining today, what's the probability that Cynthia walks? Um, so we have it raining today. We're looking for the probability that she walks. We know that it's already raining. so. That's a kind of conditional probability. Uh, so we go PR. We're looking for the probability that she walks. So walk, given that it's already raining today. So this is a conditional probability statement. The probability that she walks and it's raining today. Uh, this should be an R, sorry, not a, not a B. Okay, so going back to our conditional probability statement or formula here, it's the probability of A intersect B over the probability of B. So going back to here, we can go ahead and write that in. Where's my mouse gone? Oh, there it is. Okay. So that's going to be the probability of W intersect R over the probability of R. We're just taking that conditional probability formula and substituting in R for B and W for A. So this is something that we couldn't find using our probability table, but this is something that we can find. The probability of W intersect R is just going to be this value right here, 0 0.1. That's what that cell represents in the table. The probability of R happening is this value at the very end of the row. That's 0 0.4. So 0 0.1 divided by 0 0.4, that's going to be 1 over 4. That's our answer there. Okay, we also have this idea of independence of events. So two events A and B, if we don't have any conditional aspect to it, like if we do an event, let's say A, and then we after that we do an event B, and the odds of a particular outcome in B um, haven't changed, whether or not we did A previously or not, then those two events are independent. Uh, if I had to think of an example, let's think of two completely unrelated events. Like let's say the odds of a eruption happening in Indonesia and then me kicking a ball the next day. They're completely unrelated. So the odds of even whether it, the volcano erupts in Indonesia or not, uh, it's not going to change my odds of kicking a ball the next day. So those are independent events. Um, the th thing that you should note about independent events is there's a way that you can prove two events are independent mathematically, and that's through using this formula here. So if two events are independent, then the probability of the intersection between the events, so let's say the volcano does erupt 
and I do kick the ball, that's going to prob be the probability of me kicking the ball multiplied by the uh, probability of the eruption in Indonesia happening. So the two, uh, the two probabilities are just multiplied. And the way we get to that formula is using the conditional probability formula. We know that the probability of A given B is this according to the conditional probability formula. But we also know that since whether B happens or not, it has no bearing on A happening, then the probability of A given that B happen given that B happens is still just the probability of A itself. So what we can actually do then is we substitute in the probability of A for the probability of A intersect no, probability of A given B. And then we multiply both sides by the probability of B and we get to our independent events formula. Okay, you don't need to know how we derive that though. It's just out of, um, if any of you are curious about that. Okay, so are Cynthia walking in it raining independent events? How would we prove that? We just use that formula that we uh, saw on the previous slide. So we need, what well, we require the probability of W multiplied by the probability of R being equal to the probability of W intersect R. So I keep writing B. This is supposed to be an R. Okay, so the probability of R is 0 0.4. Remember, this is R here. We go to the end of the row. That's 0 0.4. The probability of W is 0 0.7. So that's this cell down here. And then the probability of W intersect R is 0 0.1. Um, we can notice though that 0 0.4 times 0 0.7, that's gonna be something like 0 0.28. That's not gonna be equal to 0 0.1. So then we can say uh, that the events are not independent. So that means that if Cynthia walks, then it's a, there's a higher likelihood or lower likelihood that it rains the next day. The events are related. Um, it's not that if she walks, there's the same likelihood of it raining the next day. Okay, the final way we can visualize probabilities is with tree diagrams. So you might have encountered this in your probability studies before. All we do is we draw out some branches and then we put, first of all, we consider the uh, first event, A, whether it happens or it doesn't happen. So we represent that by A and then A complement respectively. And then we can branch out from there uh, based on what B, whether B happens or not. Now, this is really useful because what actually happens is if we assign probabilities to each of these events, let's say the odds of A happening is 0 0.4, so the odds of A complement happening, so not A happening, is going to be 0 0.6. And then if we have similar, we have, well, not similar probabilities, different probabilities for B happening, let's say 0 0.3, 0 0.7, uh, 0 0.6, 0 0.4. Um, actually, no, these would also be 0 0.3 and 0 0.7. So what we can actually do is we want, if we're looking for the probability of A intersect B, then we can just multiply these two numbers along here. So we're, we're looking at this particular branch. I believe that's what we do in the next slide here. Yeah, there we go. So if we multiply along this branch. We had 0 0.4 here, I believe, and 0 0.3. We can do 0 0.4 0 0.4 times 0 0.3 and get the probability of A intersect B happening. So A and B happening simultaneously. That's the power of tree diagrams. Uh, and one thing to note there is that we're just rearranging the conditional probability formula when we do that. Because um, again, the conditional probability formula for B, given that A has happened, is the probability of B intersect A all over the probability of 
a multiply both sides by a we're going to get probability of a intersect b or in this case b intersect a which is the same thing um yeah there you go so one thing to note is that if the question asks you about two events and it wants both of them to happen at the same time, then you're most likely going to be multiplying probabilities. So in this case, we want A and B to happen at the same time. So we multiply 0 0.4 and 0 0.3. If though it wants the probability of one event happening and then also the probability of another event happening, one or the other, not both happening at the same time, then generally you're going to use addition. So if we go back to the tree diagram, let's say the question asks us, what is the probability of, uh, let me get my mouse back, A and B happening, or the probability of A and B complement happening, then you would individually find the probability of those two events and then just add them together because they're, we separated them using that word or. Okay, so and means multiply or means add. So we've got another question here. In Blairsville, if it rains the previous day, the chance of rain today is 0.6. If, if it doesn't rain the previous day, then the chance of rain today is 0.3. So using a tree diagram, if it rains on Monday, what is the probability that it rains on Wednesday? Okay, so we'll set up our tree diagram. The first event is it raining on Monday. So we'll... We'll call that rain on Monday, or it doesn't rain on Monday. That's our complement. So this is Monday, and it says, if it rains the previous day, the chance of rain today is 0 0.6. All right. So the thing is, we don't know. Oh, we, we know, actually. We know that it rained on Monday. So what we would actually do, this wouldn't be Monday, this would be Tuesday. So Monday is represented back here. We know that we're coming from a day where it rained, which means that uh, the chance of rain today is going to be 0 0.3. Oh no, the, ch the chance of rain today is 0 0.6 because it rained. And then the chance that it doesn't rain is 0 .0 0 0.4. Remember, all the, these, these probabilities need to add to 1, 0 0.6 and 0 0.4. So it rained on Monday, so the chance of it raining on Tuesday is 0 0.6. So the chance of it not raining is 1 minus 0 0.6, which is 0 0.4. Uh, then we can look at Wednesday. Whether it rains or not, that's our event of concern. So rain, not rain, uh, and then rain and not rain. So if it rained on Tuesday, then the odds of it raining on Wednesday are 0 0.6 and 0 0.4 for not raining. If it didn't rain on Tuesday, then the odds of it raining on Wednesday is 0 0.3. You can see that there, 0 0.3, and then the odds of it not raining is 0 0.7. We're looking for the probability that it rains on Wednesday. So what are the outcomes where it rains on Wednesday? It's this one or it's this one. So since, since there's that or word, we want to add these two probabilities. So if it rains on Wednesday, we're looking for um, 0 0.6 times 0 0.6 going along this branch here of the tree diagram, 0 0.6 times 0 0.6. And then we're looking at the alternative outcome. It doesn't rain on Tuesday, but it still rains on Wednesday. That's going to be multiplying along this branch here, 0 0.4 times 0 0.3. So this is going to be 0 0.36, and this is going to be 0 0.12. This is going to be 0 0.48. That's our answer. Uh, okay, cool. Um, all right, so we're just going to finish off briefly exploring this idea of combinations. So we know already that the probability of an outcome is given by the number of favorable outcomes, the number of outcomes 
uh, in that event or, or well all over the number of total outcomes so the number of outcomes in the sample space so we've considered scenarios so far where it's really easy to figure out how many outcomes there are like in the case of the previous in, in the case of this scenario here our outcome is either it rains on tuesday and wednesday or it rains on tuesday doesn't rain on wednesday so on and so forth we have four possible outcomes sometimes it's hard to know exactly how many outcomes you have because there's just so many different events going on one after the other and this is where combinations come in it helps us figure out how many outcomes there are so more specifically what combinations are is that it tells us the number of ways we can select r successes from a group of size n um, and the notation for this is n choose r this is that's how we describe it either you can express it in this way in the exam or this way in the exam vika accepts either um, the formula for this expression here n choose r is this here n factorial over r factorial times n minus r factorial we'll go into what the factorial means in the next slide but what this tells us is for instance if we need to get four questions right out of five on a test that's going to be a whole list of outcomes either we could get the first four questions right and the last one wrong or we could get the first three right the fourth one wrong and the fifth one right or we could get the first one right the second one right uh, the fifth one right and the third one right there's so many different outcomes um, this will be able to tell us exactly how many different ways we can get uh, four questions right out of five and this mathematical operation here n choose r in this case five choose four will tell us how many different ways there are for us to do that how many different outcomes there are now in terms of what a factorial is uh it's denoted first of all by this exclamation mark like we saw in the previous slide five factorial is five times four times three times two times one so any number factorial is just going to be uh the number multiplied by all whole numbers before it and you can only as a result do this operation on a whole number you kind of like 6.5 factorial uh, you can only have two factorial or three factorial. You also can't have uh, negative one factorial or negative two factorial because you can see that this chain ends at one. One thing to note, zero factorial is one. Uh, I won't go into that too much, but again, you can access those notes if you want to get a bit more of a grasp on why. Um, and something important to remember with factorials when it comes to cancelling them is you can express a factorial as a product of some other numbers alongside another factorial so for instance five factorial you can do five times four times three times two times one or you can recognize that three times two times one is itself three factorial so you can rewrite it like this okay if a coin is flipped seven times how many different outcomes are there where three heads are flipped okay so we have a total of seven uh, events essentially, and we're looking for three favorable outcomes. So that's going to be, remember n choose r. In this case, we're looking for seven choose three. We want three heads to be flipped out of seven total coin flips. So again, the formula for this is n over n factorial over r factorial times n minus r factorial this is in this case going to be 7 factorial over 3 factorial times 7 minus 3 factorial so 7 factorial over 3 factorial minus uh, times 4 factorial so again we can uh, use that tip that we learned in the previous slide 7 factorial is just 7 times 6 times 5 times 4 factorial and on the bottom we have 3 factorial times 4 factorial so these four factorials cancel out we end up with 7 times 6 times 5 over 3 factorial which is 3 times 2 times 1 and then we can simplify a bit more 
7 times 6 is 42, times 5 is 210, and then 3 times 2 is 6. So if we're dividing this by, or well, 210 by 6, 210 divided by 3 is 70, so divided by 6, it would be 35. So that's our total number of possible outcomes when we're flipping a coin seven times and we're looking for three heads. And that's it. So thank you all so much for holding on until now. Um, it's, I think we've gone a little bit over time, but uh, I hope you guys have found this helpful. Remember to always be very slow with learning the content. Methods one, two is much less fast paced than methods three, four. So take that opportunity to really digest the maths and understand it. Build that strong base for units three and four. Um, again, hopefully you guys have been asking questions throughout the chat. Uh, feel free to leave some last minute questions in the chat and I'll go ahead and respond to them. Uh, if you don't have any questions, thank you so much everyone for coming. Hope you found it helpful and yeah, I'll be signing off now. Make sure to check out Dude Smart as well. We've got lots of free resources for you as well as paid resources, which you can really take a lot away from. All right. Thank you everyone.